We'll unload and begin assembly. On a Sunday morning in October, the organ finally arrives in Jamestown. This is a special day for the whole congregation. But remember, Sunell led the effort to bring the organ to Jamestown. It's been a long wait. <laughs> in this truck is the entire instrument, 15 tons in all, weighing as much as 10 automobiles. and gold. Well, that's your pipe organ. And as you can see, it's in all kinds of pieces and boxes and cardboards and wrapping and everything's tied in so it wouldn't jump around. And it came 500 miles. And we'll be unloading it today and in a couple weeks you'll see it all put together. How much would it all weigh put together? About 30,000 pounds. How y'all gonna get him to the church? Tons. Pardon? We're gonna carry it. I never seen a pipe before, and it's my first time <coughs> seeing one, and I'm really excited to see one, and this is my first time. You first? Mm -hmm. What about that? Okay. As part of a ceremony to consecrate the new organ, 24 people have been chosen to carry pipes into the church. Is that okay? All right, sure. Remember, you're paid by weight and size. Paid by weight? <laughs> Anybody drops one now, it costs $5,000. How about one of these for you? How's that? Let's hustle it up. We haven't got the four yeah. verses. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. This is the first and last time that most of these pipes will be seen because the majority of them will be hidden behind the organ's facade. of a pipe organ here at this church and today seeing it it's just incredible it's it is becoming a reality it's almost like a dream that is finally uh, not a dream anymore I was so overcome with emotion when I had the pipe and we were waiting to come in in the procession someone asked me then how does it feel and I couldn't answer my, my throat just I, I choked up. It, it, it was as an, an emotional a time as I've ever felt, I think. It's just hard to believe that it's finally happening. The Holt Camp crew will spend the rest of the afternoon unloading the truck piece by piece. The thousands of pipes, the framework, the blowers, the ducts and wind chests, the console, and all the mechanisms of the action. Like a giant jigsaw puzzle, the pieces of the organ fill the sanctuary. It will take the crew three weeks to put it all together. Then the voicers will come to adjust the pipes to the acoustics of the church. Well, I've always uh, had a great interest in the, uh, the longevity of the organ. It's something that we're building for generations, and that's the high point for me. When we're finished, it looks like it's always been there. It doesn't look like it's been added later as an afterthought or anything like that. It's actually part of the room itself when it's finished. And that's when I get my biggest satisfaction out of the job, when the organ is set up in the final room, in the final place, and then we can really tell what it looks like. There's something wonderful about this kind of creation, that when they walk out that door, there's something very special that's here. 
Seven weeks after it arrived, the organ is complete, just in time for the annual Christmas music program. The Holt Camps have come from Cleveland to join the celebration and listen to their instrument in its new home. Good morning, Martin. It's great to see you. Boy, you picked a perfect day. Chris, Chris, I'll tell you, it's wonderful. You're going to be just so excited to see it. It's fantastic. Well, I'm looking wonderful. forward to it. It's a great time. I'm so glad y'all can make it this morning. Absolutely. Thank you. Great. Good morning. gratifying part of this is when I hear a congregation just simply let loose and sing like blue blazes. That is so great. The new pipe organ links the church to an American tradition of sacred music that stretches back to colonial times. But there's another chapter in the story of the organ in America. From the Civil War on, the organ assumed an increasingly secular place in American culture, as organ recitals moved from the church to the new concert halls. The Methuen Memorial Music Hall in Massachusetts is home to America's first concert organ, imported from Germany in 1863. These majestic instruments rivaled the cathedral organs in size and power and inspired composers to write grand new secular works for the organ. American composer John Knowles Payne wrote his patriotic Concert Variations on the Star-Spangled Banner specifically for this instrument. In the middle of the 19th century, demand for pipe organs was immense, and America's organ builders scrambled to keep pace with a boom that would last for a hundred years, making thousands of instruments for churches, homes, and concert halls. In an era before radio, television, or recordings, concert organs brought music to the masses. 
It was a matter of civic pride to have a concert organ. And all across America, they appeared in large cities and small towns alike, becoming the center of cultural life. Wherever there was an audience, the organ followed, even outdoors. In 1915, visitors to San Diego's International Exposition were entertained by an outdoor concert organ built especially for the occasion. Over 80 years later, the Spreckles organ still makes Sundays in Balboa Park something special. In 1911, John Wanamaker installed an organ in his Philadelphia department store. It grew into a gargantuan instrument with six keyboards, 729 stop tabs, and more than 28,000 pipes, what is still the largest working musical instrument in the world. The organ had a starring role in Hollywood. And though the silent era ended nearly 70 years ago, the art of silent film accompaniment is alive and well. What I like is I like the vibration as well as the sound. It has a real nice, rich feel to it, and it gets inside you, and it's wonderful, it's fun. No, there's nothing like the mighty Wurlitzer. <laughs> It's a treat. You want total entertainment at the movies. You couldn't ask for more. It's so massive, and it feels, the, I mean, it's like having a symphony orchestra, isn't it? This kind of takes you back to that time when things were a little simpler, and movies were actually still an event. Carter is a living legend, one of the few theater organists whose career stretches back into the silent era. He has been entertaining audiences for over 70 years. In the 1960s, Gaylord started a revival of silent films with traditional organ accompaniment that continues to this day. My father was a church organist in Wichita, Kansas, and um, I'd go to the movies on Saturday afternoon and there was an organist in there accompanying silent pictures. And I would sneak into my father's church and try and, 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 and do what I heard this guy doing. And um, so the, the pastor, the rector of the church came in one day while I was doing this and he says, Gaylord, out, out, out. You gotta stop playing this high fleet music in this church. And he didn't know and I didn't know was gonna support me for the rest of my life. In 1922, Carter's family moved to Los Angeles, just as Hollywood entered its first golden age. And Gaylord got his first job accompanying films while only 17. This was the era of the picture palace, when going to the movies was an event, an escape into an exotic world of opulence and fantasy. At the center of it all was the pipe organ, breathing life into the silent images and creating the emotional soundscape for comedy, horror, adventure, and romance. In 1926, Gaylord got his big break when comedian Harold Lloyd heard him play and got him an audition at Grauman's Million Dollar Theater. Gaylord landed the job, becoming at age 21 one of Hollywood's premier organists. He also began working with Lloyd to create music for his films. And I remember we were, we were checking through uh, Safety Last, and there was this scene where uh, he has lost his grip on these bricks on the uh, building, and he catches a hold of the hands of a clock, and he's hanging there over the hands of the clock. And I, I swung it at time on my hands, and he says, Gaylord, I'll do the jokes. 
Tonight, Gaylord will celebrate his 90th birthday with a farewell performance at the Paramount Theater in Oakland, California. Aisle two is to your left on this floor. Please join us in welcoming Mr. Flicker Fingers himself, Gaylord Carter. Once again, Gaylord brings to life the antics of Charlie Chaplin in The Immigrant. Chris Elliott, Gaylord's student and protege, is one of a new generation of organists who are keeping the art of silent film accompaniment alive. With each performance, the theater organist pulls off an amazing musical feat, creating the entire soundtrack of a film live in front of an audience. There is rarely a written score, so the organist must also be a composer, conjuring up all the moods and emotions that bring the film to life. The drums? Oh, well, we have lots Jim of Riggs, the Paramount's yeah, resident organist, shares some of the tricks of the band. trade. Uh, we also have silent movie sounds. Now, you're, you saw a little bit of the silent movie on the screen earlier. We have sound effects that go along with uh, making a silent picture. If you have an old car go across the screen, I push this button, it sounds like... <laughs> sounds like an old car horn. Did you hear a piano in there? Yeah. Well, there's a real piano way up high on the left side. Sounds like this. If you have a train... Matter of fact, you can make a great train sound on this. So where do aspiring organists learn how to play the pipe organ? My music director played the organ, and she was like my idol when I was growing up. And so I really wanted to do this not just for me, but for like people around me, my parents, and especially her. Garnett Alligado is at a week-long pipe organ encounter in San Francisco, sponsored by the American Guild of Organists. There, that's really great. Across town, Garnet's roommate, Sarah Phillipson, is at her morning lesson. 
Like many of their peers, this is the first time that either of the girls has played the organ. But at the end of the week, they'll be playing their first recital for friends and family. Um, what, what did we say about don't stop? Yeah. <laughs> I know, but right. I need to slow down. I okay, let's like, go back to here and just start it at a so little slower tempo. That was, that was better than you've done it before. <laughs> Until I got to that. Right, just keep going. <laughs> Sitting down at the organ for the first time was like, oh my gosh, this is me. <laughs> and it was, it was really neat to hear that I could actually make all those sounds and pull out all the stops and just, you know, play. Let's take the first group and we're going to show you where the beginning of sound starts in the organ, which is in the creation of the wind and the blower room. So Another part of the pipe organ encounter up. is learning how an organ works. Okay, follow me in and watch your head. The sound of the pipe organ begins down in the blower room with the, the generation of here. wind pressure by a set of powerful electric fans. Just as a person draws yeah. breath to sing, the blowers act as the lungs of the organ, creating the wind to make the pipes speak. Well, this is where the wind starts out in the organ. There are two big blowers. They're basically just big fans encased in these cast aluminum housings. And there's another one over there on the other side. This wind starts off on this organ in two different pressures. If you look over there, you see two great big boxes. One is natural wood and one is uh, red, painted. And that's where the wind is stored. They actually act as reservoirs until the wind is needed up in the organ. Let me show you what happens when I kick on a blower. This is what they call the low pressure blower. And that basically acts as a storage space for the wind until it's needed up in the chests upstairs. That expands and that whole thing flexes and moves up and down as the wind is needed in the organ. So if somebody were to tromp on a big cord in the organ, that whole thing would sag back down and fill itself back up with this blower here. We also have a higher pressure blower for the trumpets and the big pedal stops, and that fills up that smaller reservoir over there. The console, the control center of the organ, has keyboards, pedals, and knobs called stops. The stops turn on different sets of pipes, allowing the organist to change the sound of the instrument to suit different styles of music. Okay, now we're gonna find out how we get from the keyboard to the actual chest and actually make the notes. So I'd like four of you to go right in through that door. Two, three, and four. Okay, then I need all three of you guys to sit here on the bench. Trump on the keyboards for us, guys. I want to show these people what happens. This organ has a mechanical action. Each key is connected to a long wooden rod called a tracker, which goes up through the organ and is connected to a valve underneath the pipe. When a key is pressed, the tracker pulls open the valve and lets wind into the pipe. Now some pedal action for us. Now we have a whole different set of things to move down here. All righty, that was just lovely. <laughs> okay, let's head on up to the organ inside. So you'll see a few wooden pipes as you go by. There's a part of the pedal. Even says what it is on the back. <laughs> Follow me up if you would. This organ is three stories tall. Watch your step. On the second level is the group of pipes called the positive division. Now we've been following these trackers up. We started down at the keyboard and then we watched them as they crawled up the side of the organ and made a few turns. And here's one place where they finally end up. If you look right under here, underneath this chest, you can see the very ends of the trackers and they're connected to little wires that go up in the chest. And now we're gonna take a peek right inside the chest. I'm gonna loosen this cover up. You can see there's a lot of wind in there. There's so much, I'm gonna have to shut the organ off. I'm gonna move one of these trackers down. And as you can see, it's connected to a wire that actually pulls down this piece of wood called a pallet. 
And under that pallet's a little hole that admits air up into the channels and lets us play the pipes. Okay, right now we're standing in front of the positive division of the organ. The thousands Each of pipes of in this organ are grouped downstairs. into four divisions. <laughs> each with its own keyboard and distinct sound. By combining stops from each division, the organist can create a limitless variety of sounds, everything from the softest flute to a mighty roar that shakes the building. Okay, let's head on up to the swell. At the top of the organ is the swell division. It's unique because its pipes are enclosed in a box with shutters, which allows the organist to control their volume. Okay, we're going to show you how the swell box works. You know how in a house, Venetian blinds let the light in and out? Well, the same thing happens in the swell box to control volume. Hey, Ron? Yes. Why don't you give us a demonstration of how the swell box works? It takes skill, coordination, and years of practice to master the pipe organ. Wimberly is 15. He has studied organ since he was 10 and attended three pipe organ encounters. Today, he's giving his first formal recital at Stanford University's Memorial Church. Listening in the audience is his proud mother. I think when Jack gets charged up and gets into the power of the instrument, it gets very overwhelming for me to realize that that's, that's my son up there playing that instrument. Most of the, the attitude that kids have towards organ, oh, it's an old fogey instrument that it's not very popular anymore. But it's just so fun to play. I mean, you have lots and lots of power behind just 10 fingers and two feet. And I say do it if you really want to, because it's a lot of fun. Across the centuries, the pipe organ has set the tone for special occasions of commemoration or celebration, whether marking a solemn moment in the life of a nation or adding a note of joy to a special day in the life of a community. On a November day in New York, Two very different rituals are unfolding at two very different churches. At St. Thomas Church on...